everyone for being here. So we um, just wanted to have a discussion really about the things that are common and the things that are maybe different about open education and open science. Cable said this morning in his um, talk that open education, everyone in the open education movement shares a vision. And to the extent that that is true, it's great and it's taken many years to get here, I would say. Um, but if you scratch down into the details, it ha it's not entirely true. And the conversations that the community has been having over the course of the last few years to figure out what, are the, what do we all actually mean by open education have been hugely constructive and productive. So we wanted to, kind of in the spirit of experimentation and exploration, have a similar conversation about what do we really mean about open and the world of open science and open education to see if there's something to learn there and to become more aware as there are more open movements showing up, open access to data, um, open science, open education. Where can we assume that when we use the word open, we're all talking about the same things, and where do we need to kind of keep our radar out and keep our ears open for what differences might lie underneath? Um, yeah, and this was, in theory, a questioning your assumption session, so it's like a questioning your assumptions light. I guess. I guess it's only half an hour. Um, but in some ways, just to help set up the frame, we were talking about how imagine if there were two meetings going on in this hotel right now. One was this one. And all the people here are here for open education, all the rest. And, and in some rooms, maybe just down the hall, there's a totally separate meeting on open science. And they're having all their conversations, and there's none. And imagine if one of you got lost just took the wrong turn, wandered into a room, and you sat down, and you were sitting there and you were listening. How long would it be before you realized you were in the wrong meeting? <laughs> How long would it take before you said, wait a minute, you know, the, the way they're talking about these issues and the sort of driving goals behind their work and you know the language they're using and so on and so forth is different. Would it be just immediate and you'd say, whoa, you know, I'm in a different space, you know, they're advocating for different policies, they're doing different things, or would it just be literally the session's over and then you're going, huh, you know, oh, I'm in the wrong room, but it all made sense to me. I'm right there with you. I understand why we talk about open data and why we talk about citizen science and so on and so forth. So it, it comes, we're both scientists, and we're also both very active in the open education space, and so I dance among the two. And, there's times when I feel like I'm very comfortably transitioning from one to the other, and there's times when I don't, and I find that if I use an open education phrase, like, um, you know, we should make it so everything is remixable because that's part of customization and adaptation. And I'm talking to a group of scientists who are worrying about something like sharing data sets. Like, they, they start freaking out on you because they go, wait, what, what are you talking about, right? Our data need to stay intact and they have to have this sort of internal integrity and you know we don't want people mixing that stuff up. We might want people to have access to it, but remix absolutely not. Um, and so it just became interesting to us to start thinking about whether we as a group could have a conversation, brainstorm a little, the places where there is and isn't commonality. Uh, and actually I think the next slide captures yeah. yeah so we, we threw up a few broad areas that at least I've heard in these two different domains quite a bit as being areas of general concern. And concern doesn't necessarily mean they're always worries. It's areas that they either see strong advocacy for or areas where people feel that you know openness has a real problem, right? There's a problem to answer. So quality control. Quality control of resources, for example, in open education. In open science, we usually talk about it as publications. I use the journal articles. What are the what is the intersection of open with those things? How does open either make quality control harder or quality control perhaps easier? Open up new avenues for or of data or of outcomes, methods. So outcomes in education, presumably that means learning gains. Outcomes in science, that means something like, well, you actually got valid results, right? You used a good methodology and, and you ended up with something that was worthwhile. Expectations of expertise. Expertise plays really interesting, you know, interestingly in the open space. Is there a place for expertise? Where? 
when don't we need them? When do we absolutely need them? Um, expectations on remix. Remix is a buzzword. In many domains, they have very different perceptions of what remix is. Distributed collaboration, one of the supposed great possibilities here with the internet, social networking tools, that sort of thing. Um, how does that play into the way we understand both the opportunities and the risks in education, and then similarly, opportunities and risks in science? Um, so, I guess the next slide. So we thought what might be interesting, because we have relatively little time, is to ask all of you to stop facing here and find each other. And you can pair up or get in groups of four or have a big powwow of ten in the corner. It really doesn't matter to me how you want to organize yourselves that much. But maybe a first show of hands, how many people here feel they have some idea of what open science means or you have a scientific background and feel like that's something you can speak to? Just raise your hands. Higher. So can you kind of look around, identify a few people who have self-anointed as being able to at least speak to some of the issues on the science side? And it would be nice if maybe one of those people was present. It's not necessary, but you might think about that scattering ourselves a little bit. And we would love for you kind of, I mean, these are just prompts. But so for example, with quality control around, say, educational data. For whom is quality control of educational data an issue? Why do we care about that? Who's responsible for ensuring that it happens? Why is it important? Why do we care? Who suffers if it's lacking? And then how would we know? And it would be interesting to do that for the science side and the education side, and you could have a conversation about it. And obviously you're not going to do all those things and necessarily answer all the questions, but just a way of starting to get this group, which I think would be a great group to think about this stuff, to start putting a language to how, if we're talking about some of the major drivers or major barriers to the growth of open education, or open science, or both together, where do we need to be careful about what we say? Because they might actually be very different. Or where is it essentially the same statements, right? You get up and hear the same keynotes, and they're advocating for the same thing. Is that making any sense? People kind of following that at all? <laughs> and then once you converse for 10 minutes, we would love for people to just share a few thoughts about, OK, you know, what we see is this idea of open education this really works for these audiences, and this is a big plus, and we can promote this. Whereas maybe in open science, we can see why people would struggle with this concept. Or you can have very different conclusions depending on what you looked at. And we can just kind of hear those. And what we'll do certainly is compile all those and share those back. Um, and that's really it. To, to help with that, though, if in your groups, if one of you has a computer open, could just take some notes and just take the notes, write in an email to Arash, and we'll have all the notes from all the groups, even ones who don't hear from. Uh, this big group, can someone just very briefly tell us a little bit about the shape of your environment? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I hate to interrupt your talking, but can you all listen? We're going to be done in two minutes, so let's just hear what are two thoughts. Uh, well, we, were, we were kind of focusing around the dialogue about it. If I'm a scientist and I collect all this data, should I allow my data to be continually used and manipulated? Um, and we know this is a perverse world that we live in, um, and, and that data can be manipulated against us. And some of us feel very strongly against that, because most of us do. But that data should, should remain intact, but it should be open. Validating other things, finding other uh, findings, results, etc. Interesting. So open in that case is just access. Right. Yeah, science dictates you can't cross this line back and forth. There's a method you have to follow that. Method. Interesting. Any, anyone want to respond to that? Any questions? Yeah. Well, you know, just a question. One thing we continually see come up. Um, so I'm in a university where none of our scientists have data. Um, the university has the data. The university owns the data and retains ownership to it. And so, whereas with our scholarship, our, our papers and our, our educational materials, our employee agreements, transfer copyright back to us, 
we can share it as we wish. The data and, and sort of a lot of the other products and, or the processes of the intellectual work are university owned. And so to even get to that question of can we share this <coughs> means a whole different set of stakeholders and data governance policies than we have on the, on the education side. <coughs> Um, I think that the statement about uh, um, there being a specific method to handle this data is correct, but then it, uh, that equating that method with specific individuals is in incorrect, right? Because there are people who um, can uh, do science who are not part of the official uh, apparatus or are not motivated by profit and therefore do not have the resources to access that thing. So that's part of the issue. And I think we really marginalize those people. Like, now that's just Joe Blow in his garage, what impact is he going to have? But we're starting to see increasingly there are people outside of commercial structures that are actually doing real innovation. I'm just curious, did, you, did this group get into the question of, that was on the science side, what about educational data? Outcomes data, students, advocacy data on resources, that sort of thing. Do you have a similar problem with research that comes out of that? We didn't focus on the research. Side. Okay. We, just, we did go on to the education side and said that you know, as science, we should make all those topics of science freely available based on quality research. Is it one of the groups back here? Jerson. So we had a lot of discussion uh, mainly about uh, you know, groups outside of the typical apparatus and structure of the science and engineering community and how they can be marginalized and be affected by the black book of materials, uh, especially people, you know, in co countries like this, uh, working outside of the, the grid, uh, and not necessarily a hobbyist in his garage. But we also talked about uh, people living in developed nations where they don't have material or resources to get hundred-year-old documents on power engineering to construct a power grid in a place like Afghanistan, and how that can really hurt those countries and you know, send them back. And so what's the advocacy statement there? Well, I suppose uh, opening up a lot of those materials, uh, non-current research and even some current research. Well, and I think one of them was that in this particular example, we were talking about like IEEE and the fact that there's potentially documents that are enclosed under uh, uh, um, you know, access costs that are in fact in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of crazy. And so in terms of advocacy, I would deliberate those things personally. I mean, if literally there's no copyright rules in closing that, and yet you have to pay forty nine ninety five to get the document, that makes no sense to me. Did anyone discuss the idea of allowing derivatives of published journals? Hmm. Whether you thought that was a good or a bad idea? Hmm. RF, I'm so sorry, Carol. This is a we're two minutes over. We've got to switch to the next session. So I'm yeah. so sorry. Oh, sorry, another session coming right now. No, I think we have a few minutes. We're going to do a few minute break, but we've. Okay. I know, I know. That's fine. Any last thought anyone felt needs to share? All right, well, you can feel free if you want. I would love it, actually, if, you, if there were any insights that you had. Yeah. Any particular sorry, catchphrases, really anything at all that you want to email me, and I'll throw them all up onto the okay, 2011 site. Um, and otherwise, feel free to come around and share your thoughts. Hopefully, you can Hopefully it sparked a little thinking about these two domains. Yeah. Thank you.